This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on corporate issuers. The overwhelming majority of the focus of the reading is on corporate governance. But I want to call your attention to the first, you know, 10 or 15 pages of this reading. This is everything that I teach in my corporate finance class that answers questions that sound like, what is the structure of a business? What is the structure of a corporation? And how does it essentially make decisions? And you'll see that as we go through these learning outcome statements. Notice that the term corporate governance is in a handful of these. We'll talk about the principal agent relationship, and then we'll go ahead and start with a discussion on the different stakeholders. Now, what we learned from Medigliani and Miller all the way back in 1958 in their seminal capital structure paper, and by the way, that's a point of emphasis and well it should be by the CFA Institute, we learned that the goal of the business is to maximize shareholder wealth. However, in that maximizing shareholder wealth, there has to be a consideration of other stakeholders, and the Institute is pretty concerned about all those other stakeholders. All right, so what happens here? In the, in the course of the lifetime of a business, it borrows a lot of money on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. It uses that money, uses that capital to invest in long-term assets that generate product lines or services. And so this is you know, what I think of as kind of a really uh, efficient, I'll call it you know, maybe a, a corporate cycle. And what happens is the executives then invest in these product lines and services and they generate cash flow. And from that cash flow, the shareholders get dividends. And from that cash flow, the bondholders get an interest payment and a return of principal. So this is kind of a perfect thing. But it's not perfect in that there is this principal agent relationship. You know, the executive le leadership team is an agent and they are hired to act in the best interest of the shareholders, right? Now, this is all done through the board of directors. So what we have to do is we have to be aware that the, that the agents, the executive leadership team, are tempted, right? Back in our economics reading, we learned that individuals act in their own self-interest. And so imagine that you're a chief executive officer and... Um, you raised a lot of capital on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. And let's just suppose that amount was a billion dollars. So you, you show up for work the next day with a billion dollars in your pocket. Now, of course, you made a promise. You made a promise to the people on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. You said, look, I'm going to take your money. I'm going to be a good steward of your capital. And I'm going to invest it in uh, this new product line. Think of Jim's concrete company, I'm going to start investing in trees and forests and two by fours because I'm going to start building, I'm going to build homes. Not only am I going to build the foundation, but now I'm going to use the wood to build the frame on the home. All right, so I'm going to do my best to become an expert in home building. But think about what you're tempted. You're tempted to think that, man, I'm the greatest CFO that ever lived. I just convinced a billion dollars worth of people, a billion dollars worth of investors to lend me their hard-earned capital. I deserve a raise. I deserve a bonus. I deserve more administrative assistance. I deserve uh, a bigger office. I deserve a limousine service. I deserve a country club membership. I deserve, I deserve, right? So what do we call these? These are called uh, executive benefits. And shareholders are perfectly happy to pay for executive benefits if they increase the cash flows of the firm. The example that I give students all the time is a membership in the country club. You know, do shareholders want to pay $50,000 or $100,000 to have the chief marketing officer have a membership at the local country club? And the answer is, well, I'm going to do this again. Marginal costs versus marginal benefits. If the marketing executive is uh, just going up and playing golf and tennis and ignoring his or her responsibilities, then the answer is no. But if the marketing executive is using the country club to bring potential customers there to play tennis and golf and swim and eat lobster and steak, and all of a sudden these potential customers call us and say, you know what, give me 10,000 of whatever it is that you're selling, right? Marginal cost, marginal, and uh, marginal benefits. So look at that second uh, point. 
The principal agent relationship involves obligations, trust, and expectations of loyalty. So it's up to the board of directors to monitor the executive behavior as it relates to the consumption of those benefits. Ah, I love talking about that stuff. Uh, do yourself a favor and type in Dennis Kozlowski and Tycho and uh, see what Dennis put his, uh, his shareholders through. This is somewhere around the year 2000. Fascinating story. All right, here's, uh, here's an example of this conflict. So shareholders expect to maximize cash flows. Managers want to maximize their own personal wealth. This is what we, we, I was talking about here just a few moments ago. Are you ready for this? Uh, if you're the executive and you have a choice between investing in a branded product line or investing in a new product line. How about if I use this example? I think I used this in just a, a recent one, but it's relevant here. You know, let's suppose we're Hershey Foods and we have this, uh, we have these brand product lines, right? The Hershey chocolate bar. So maybe we want to expand this to another country, or maybe we want to make more chocolate bars in this particular part of the, our country, or, or, or. So let's suppose that's going to cost us $100 million. Or we have this other choice. We could invest $100 million in a breath mint. Well, what do shareholders want? Shareholders are going to say, you know what? There's not a lot of growth in Hershey chocolate bars. You know, pretty much we sell it to all the people that want it. But we don't do anything about We don't do anything about breath mints. Let's go try to capture the bad breath market. And of course, Milton Hershey developed this. Uh, icebreaker product line and it's after 20 years or so it's now its own brand name but you see the point here the shareholders they want riskier projects because they want to capture the upper tail of the distribution but the managers they probably don't want that what if they invest all their capital in the in the uh, icebreaker product line and it's a total failure or well, they might they might lose their job there's some examples. Entrenchment, that's what I was talking about. Empire building and excessive risk taking. All right, agency theory and agency cost. This is what uh, this is what I was just talking about. Agency theory is just this idea that there is a principal and there is an agent and they may or may not have the same goals. Agent th agency theory, right? So agency costs then are the cost to try to attempt to reduce that agency conflict. And these are, uh, these are mostly monitoring costs. So what does the board of directors do? Well, it has, a, it has a, a compensation committee. And so this compensation committee will determine whether or not the executive uh, is, it warrants an investment in a country club membership for that executive. And then it'll have to monitor the receipts, you know? So if the receipt comes in, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll just use myself as an example. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Jim went up to the country club and had lobster and steak and bought a case of Budweiser and didn't come back to work in the afternoons. Well, that's a clear indication that I'm probably not doing my job. But if the, if the, expense report comes in and says something like, you know, Jim hosted a potential client uh, over here that's going to build homes in that area over there. A potential client, with, he went golfing with uh, a politician who has a law uh, that is likely to be passed, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, so agency costs, these are the marginal costs that I was talking about and the marginal cost, marginal benefit kind of a discussion. And then there's the the uh, there's what's known as the residual loss, and that's the excess consumption. So imagine if I'm well, let's not take my extreme example, but let's suppose that instead of a case of Budweiser, I only have three Budweisers, and I come back to work, and uh, and I don't do my job as efficiently because uh, I've been drinking at lunchtime, and so my productivity falls. Um, I'm not as, I'm not popular in the office, you know, I mean, all sorts of bad things can happen according to that. So the agency costs are lumped into all those costs that try to reduce that conflict. And I encourage you all the time to read the Wall Street Journal. There are articles on there regularly about executives out there who do something like I just described. 
Now, remember a few slides ago, we talked about this difference between the uh, controlling shareholders and minority shareholders. There's another section in the reading that goes into a little bit more detail. But remember what I said just a few moments ago about, you know, how the minority shareholders ought to ought to approach the controlling shareholders when there's kind of uh, of a conflict. What I was suggesting earlier is that there probably was a concentrated set of, of minority shareholders. And so think about this. We, you know, we can have dispersed, we can have shareholders all the way over, or we can have this concentration, whether it's a controlling or a minority or some kind of a hybrid. And this is what I was saying earlier, that depending on those different types, types of concentrations within the ownership structure, there could be conflicts of interest between and among uh, each one of those. So over the years, to kind of uh, lessen this conflict, uh, corporations have come up with some pretty interesting ideas. Dual class shares, where there's uh, class A shares that they get to vote for board of directors. Class B shares, they don't get to vote at all. I mean, that's an extreme example. And so you can, you can divide the dual class shares into, uh, into almost anything that you want. Yeah, look at the last arrow point. Uh, mitigate the dilution of voting power and continue control of the board of directors. And so, you know, there's there's all different sorts of things. Whoops. There's all different sorts of ways. You know, there's cumulative voting. There are classified boards. Uh, there's all different sorts of stuff in here to try to influence how the board can look beyond just the maximizing of the shareholder wealth goal. Oh, this is super important here, information asymmetry. In fact, in that 1958 paper, Medigliani and Miller assumed, assumed uh, what were known as homogeneous expectations, meaning that everybody, both inside and outside of the company, had the same information set about the product lines of the business. And that was clearly a limiting, uh, a limiting assumption. But even they, in the latter part of the paper, said, you know, this is really not true. Uh, the managers probably have more sense of the quality of the assets than someone like me, just a regular old shareholder. Uh, let's go ahead and piggyback on that agency description that I gave you about searching for risky projects, the Hershey product, the Hershey, uh, Hershey chocolate bar versus the icebreaker. Well, the same thing holds true with the bondholders. Bondholders prefer that Milton Hershey invests in more chocolate bars and less risky projects. No, not less risky projects, but projects, uh, they want projects that are less risky. Yeah, I think I said that the right way. All right, corporate governance. Here's a good definition to memorize a system of checks and balances and incentives. Ah, that's really important. So the compensation committee of the board of directors is responsible for creating a compensation package under which the executive leadership teams feels like they're a valued asset to the business and that they don't really have an incentive to consume all of these extra benefits you know, in the academic world, we call this an excess consumption of perks. And what this does is it manages uh, all of those conflicts, not just between the shareholders and the executive leadership team, but between and among all of the other stakeholder groups. Yeah, corporate governance outlines the rights and roles and responsibilities of various persons. And, uh, you know, I think you've heard me say over the years listening is that, you know, I'm a gigantic sports fan and uh, I was uh, somewhat of an athlete in the old days and my children uh, as well. And I've always said to my children when they when they say something like, oh, something about their coaches. And I'm like, you know, look, go up and ask your coach, like, what do you think is my asset? And what do you think is my liability? Think like an accountant. And so I think that uh, a great a great coach identifies accurately the roles of each player on on a team. And of course, that's got to be a function of a good corporate governance strategy, rights, roles and responsibilities. I like that. There's that word that we hear all the time nowadays in a transparent manner, but it's clearly true uh, inside of corporate governance. All right, so let's take a look at some of these mechanisms 
to manage this relationship and to lessen the associated risks. All right, and these are pretty obvious ones here. So corporate reporting and transparency. So what do we get? What do we get from the executive? You know, we get to go to the annual meeting, which we'll talk about in just a second. And at that annual meeting, we get an annual report. And that annual report, and you remember this from our financial statement conversations in previous readings, that that financial report has a ton of financial information, but it also has a ton of non-financial information. And then we can we can look outside of the business to uh, you know kind of external stuff. We get all sorts of information there, and. Why do we need this information? Oh, it reduces information asymmetry. That's probably a really good exam question. What we wanna do is we wanna say that, look, we can use this information to evaluate the performance of not only the company and its ability to generate cash flows, but also its managers. And so essentially what we're doing is we're uh, evaluating the board of directors because the board is supposed to evaluate, uh, right? So of course we can make investment decisions and we can vote on matters. So we can go to the annual meeting. Uh, every shareholder gets a proxy letter that says something like, uh, you know, dear Mr. and Mrs. Shareholder, uh, you are cordially invited to our annual meeting, which will be held in the city of Cincinnati or Chicago or San Francisco. And there'll be an agenda list on there and it'll say something like, well, election of board of directors, approvals, dividends, compensations, all, all different sorts of things. And we'll be able to vote. So if you come to the meeting, bring your pencil and you can go ahead and vote. If you don't want to come to the meeting, go ahead and uh, go ahead and vote and send it in through the mail or do it electronically. Or if you don't want to vote at all, then you'll allow the executive leadership team to vote your shares for you. That's called uh, proxy voting. I did mention cumulative voting in a previous slide. Let me tell you about that. If I own one share and there are five uh, board seats available, I can I can vote for each one of those five people. But if I have cumulative voting and I have one share, what I can do is I can take one times five and I can take my one share times five gives me five votes and I can vote for just one. So it would be zero, 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 zero and five for one of those, uh, one of those shareholders. Or I could do zero and two and zero and two and one, or I could do, you know, whatever mathematical combination that, uh, that you could come up with. Shareholder activism, uh, I would love to spend the next 27 hours just telling you all about this. Uh, part of my dissertation was on poison pills, uh, better known, uh, I should say lesser known as shareholder rights plans. And so, uh, you know, I wrote my dissertation in 1993 or so, and this was really, you know, kind of the beginning of shareholder activism. And so essentially shareholder activism just means that, you know, a group of shareholders get together and they say something like, you know what, we, we think these executives stink. You know, maybe they stink in general, you know, a general stinkiness, or they stink at this or they stink at that, or maybe we'll rank their level of stink. Uh, I'm guessing that you have figured out that stink is not, uh, that's not a word I got from the, uh, uh, from the reading. And so what we do is we use our collectivism uh, to influence the company. And this happens all the time. Again, read the Wall Street Journal. You'll see articles about this. So look down forms of activism, you know, engagement, stewardship, proxy fights, proposing shareholder resolutions. So that's the whole deal with my dissertation with a, uh, with a poison pill that, uh, that firms the Supreme Court of Delaware ruled that, uh, that the executive leadership team did not need approval by the shareholders to adopt a poison pill. And that's why they called them shareholder rights plan because who in the world would be in favor of something that's poisonous? Now, of course, what shareholders can do is they can just sue the board of directors. They can say, you know what? We, we don't like what you've been doing. You're not, you're not putting the company in the appropriate strategic plan. And have you evaluated your executive leadership team lately? Look at these individuals. Look at what they're doing. They're running the company into the ground. And then, of course, there's this uh, market for corporate control. If we're influence, influential enough, what we can do is we can uh, we can use our influence to maybe promote a takeover 
or an acquisition. And we can do this a couple of uh, a couple of different ways because you know you think about it, the what happens in many times there are friendly mergers and so these are two people it's like a marriage you know two people they get together they love each other you know and everyone's happy so you have two firms the executive leadership team of both firms they like each other and so they get together and nobody gets fired but the problem then becomes when uh, the one firm says we're going to take over this firm and we're going to fire all those people so this then uh, results in chaos so tender offers sometimes they can be friendly but a lot of times they're not but a lot of times those tender offers become hostile you know so the sense here is this shareholder mechanism is that the threat of a takeover is going to align the executives with the shareholder goals now, how about uh, mechanisms for the top right of the balance sheet? So the bond indenture, this is the legal and binding comp document that outlines you know, all the stuff that's going to happen. So if I'm Jim's concrete company and I issue a bond, you know, this is, uh, I make an explicit, I make a legal promise that if you lend me a billion dollars today, I'm gonna repay you your billion dollars and I'm gonna pay you a coupon rate, let's say it's five or 10%, whatever that number is, and I'm gonna do it over 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. And so this indenture contains all of the legal terms and conditions. And, uh, you know, over the years, I've read a bunch of these. Uh, I don't really recommend that you do this, but you can find these online pretty easily. Uh, they're fairly dull, but some of uh, some of these, uh, in fact, most of them are going to contain covenants. Some of them are going to be, whoops, some of them are going to be positive covenants that say something like, oh, the firm should do this and this and this. And then some will be negative, like the firm is not allowed to do this and this or this, like the firm is not allowed to pay a dividend if it doesn't pay an interest payment. And then, of course, one of the important components of the indenture is uh what kind of collateral, if any, if any, um, you know, uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these bond issues, especially for large corporations, are unsecured. You know, and, uh, inside of the indenture, there'll be a sentence that reads something like, you know, the general, the general ability of the firm to produce operating cash flows, it will be sufficient to repay this, uh, repay this loan. But lots of bond issues, of course, are secured. And so if I were Jim's concrete company, it would say something like, look, Jim's going to take his cement truck here. That's going to be one piece of collateral. And then he owns a bunch of land over there that has sand underneath it. That's another piece of collateral. And then he has a, uh, a bunch of rocks over there. That's another piece of collateral. So what does collateral do? It, it lowers uh, default risk. Uh, once again, we can go back to corporate reporting and transparency. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and then, you know, when when if you or I fail to make our car loan payments, you know, what happens? Someone will show up in our driveway and they'll have another key to the car and they'll just start it up and they'll drive away. You know, they'll repossess our car. And that's pretty much the end of the story. However, when you're dealing with a large corporation that has tens of billions of dollars in bond issues and, you know, let's just say hundreds of thousands of bondholders spread throughout the world, it's not quite as easy as coming in and starting up a car and leaving with it. And so, of course, you need a judge, you need bankruptcy court, but you need a creditor committee, which is going to act in the interests uh, of the bondholders to say something like, you know what, that truck that Jim used as collateral, that particular truck, it has a flat tire. We don't want to sell that. It has a, but that truck over there, that's a beautiful one. Let's go ahead and substitute that truck. So the com this uh, creditor committee, you know, kinds of tried... Uh, attempts to negotiate and discuss and restructure and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, board of directors, there's probably not anything on this slide that, uh, that I haven't mentioned before, provides oversight, serves as a link. We know all that stuff. Um, yeah, what, what's the bottom there? Functions include uh, audit committee, what does that mean? The audit committee is probably made up of at least the accountant, like the, the Johnson & Johnson board has uh, has one accountant on it, and clearly that individual is on the audit committee. And so, the, you know, the auditors will know, you know, do the debits go over here, do the credits go over here? And there are governance committees, and this is super important 
uh, especially in the last 30 years. So this committee establishes and monitors all the stuff that we've been talking about, you know, for the last 30 or minutes or so. There's also a compensation committee. I talked about that before. They determine what kind of compensation is fair and reasonable for the executive leadership team. And what's the goal here to align the goals of the business with the goals of the executive leadership team. Uh, nomination committee. This is important because what we don't want is that we don't want a board member to sit on the board for a hundred years because sooner or later that board member is going to be quite familiar, <coughs> excuse me, and quite friendly with all the executive leadership team so that their independence might be questioned. You know, so there's probably an optimal time that a board member sits and serves on a board so what the nomination committee does is it's responsible for saying, OK, Jim, you've been on the board for four years and, you know, we love what you've been doing. How much longer do you think you want to serve? And I might say three years or two years and they'll say, OK, that's fine. We're OK with a seven year term, but we need to find somebody who's going to replace you. And they'll probably ask me. Uh, hey, do you have anybody in mind? And so what the nomination committee will do is I'll probably give them two or three names and, you know, other board members and, and other people out there will say, hey, you know what? I hear Jim wants to resign his board position. I think Betty over there would be a great replacement. And so the nomination committee is responsible for having a seamless, right, a seamless board over time. Oh, risk committee. This is so important. I love this one. Uh, because, uh, you know, in the last 10 years or so, at least since at least since 2008 financial crisis, that uh, that firms now have a chief risk officer that is responsible for establishing and maintaining a risk culture throughout the firm. And so, as you can imagine, there would be a risk committee. All right. How about employee mechanisms to manage this uh, this principal agent relationship? All right. So, you know, as an employee, they have a contract. And so, I mean, I sign a contract every year for my school and that contract says something like, you know, Jim, you have to teach these number of courses. You have to have this many office hours. You have to advise students. You have to do research. Uh, you have to do stuff. And in return, what we'll do is we'll pay you uh, for all of those services. And so that gives me rights and responsibilities. And those probably can be coordinated through uh, human resource department. But then when we get outside of the business, there are laws. I mean, you know, somewhere along the line, if uh, if my school said to me, you know what, Jim, this semester we are requiring you to teach 20 courses. And I'll say something like, well, you know, I don't really have the time or the expertise to teach 20 students to even to 20 courses. Do we even have the students? But it's really not in my contract. So I'm not quite sure that uh, you can force me to do that. So we have all these labor laws out there. And these are important uh, in, in terms of determining things like and I'm just going to use a general word out there in terms like fair fairness. What's what's reasonable? What can be reasonably expected? Uh, in this relationship between the employer and the employee. Now, I think a great exam question inside of this LOS, look at where we have issues there, pension and retirement plans. So we spend lots and lots of time here, especially in level three, on how to put together a policy statement for a pension fund. And this is super important. This will be a link between that LOS and, and these LOSs. Customers, of course, we have contracts, social media. You know, I remember when we just started having the Internet at school and I remember my students coming to me and, and saying something like, oh, you know what? When I buy something over there and I don't like it, I can go to this social platform and I can say, you know what? That product doesn't do any good. And I thought, wait a minute, this this is dangerous. This is dangerous to have the public with a forum that's uh I don't know. I don't want to say unregulated, but at least unmonitored or something. So, you know, uh, I'm in favor of taking my phone and smashing it uh, with a sledgehammer because it's uh, clearly the marginal cost of my phone is not uh, is not anywhere near the marginal benefit. 
So you guys know this better than I do. Social media can be used to spread information and misinformation or disinformation, uh, etc. All right, here we go. Government, government mechanisms so we can regulate and we can pass laws and we can have corporate governance codes. All right, so think about, think about the regulations that come from the different governments, federal or uh, federal or local, but then what these government bodies, and these can be independent bodies, boy, I could even say something like, you know, the Institute has these corporate governance codes. You know, what do we call these? The, you know, the code and the professional standards. So these are guiding principles for those of us who would like to be uh, part of the chartered financial analyst designation. And so we, you know, we, we need to live by by these rules. And so we can have guiding principles for publicly traded companies. And these corporate governance codes, they can be formal or they can be informal. You know, here's a section on the difference between uh, laws in different countries, civil laws and common laws. Look at that third block point down there. Common laws are common in uh, the United States and UK, Canada, civil law uh, common in other other European countries. So I probably remember that third block point. Uh, here's an obvious slide here. Good corporate governance. There's the green arrow up. Uh, weak corporate governance. There's the red arrow down. And so let me just read some of these. Stronger business connections, stronger operational efficiency, enhanced control procedures, better financial performance, uh, reduced level of risk. And that's probably, boy, if I were creating the exam question, that's probably the one that I would focus on. And so go down to the very bottom. If we have weak corporate governance, what are we going to do? We're going to uh, unnecessarily increase legal risks, reputational risks, regulatory risks, default risks, operational risks, systematic risks. I mean, any liquidity risks, any kind of risk that we've talked about. All right, so remember, this is a great exam question. I would focus on risks. And then what the Institute emphasizes here are these operational risks. Remember, operational risks are those risks of losses due to things like you know, a failed process, things like failed policies, failed systems, uh, maybe some kind of events or failed people that disrupt the uh, normal business operations. And so look at that first arrow point. We control systems, uh, incapable monitoring tools, right? What are they going to do? There, there's no way, there's no way that these things are going to lead to anything but, uh, but problems. So remember that we have this increase in uh, operational risks. So what do we need? We need adequate scrutiny. We need an effective audit committee. And what this is going to do is this going to lead to better operating performance and so what have I emphasized during this slide deck? Think about operating performance as operating cash flows. Boy, legal, regulatory, or reputational risk. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and suggest that this became super popular uh, back in the late uh, 1990s, especially with Enron and Global Crossing. And then, uh, you know, as we hit the uh, hit the 2008 financial crisis, which, you know, arguably started back in the 1960s. But you have this, you know, legal risks, they've all been defined. You know, we still have we still have individuals inside of these companies who break the law. But then there are regulatory risks as well in which, you know, companies might try to pollute a little bit more than they're uh, legally responsible to or some kind of regulations. But my point here is that reputational risks, these are super important. Uh, think about uh, a couple of hits on reputation that you may or may not be aware of. You know, I go all the way back to uh, when I was in high school. Uh, are you guys even aware of this story? Somebody, some individual went into the drugstores, we called them drugstores back in that day, uh, and bought a uh, a bottle of Tylenol where they had the capsules and you could pull the capsules apart and the medicine was inside and you could pour pour the medicine out and some individual put cyanide in there, put the capsule back on, put the cop 
top back on and went to the store and and put it back on the shelves and there were a handful of deaths and so this reputation reputational risk you know buy my product and you die i mean that's an extreme example but then uh the company came up with the uh the coverings and so now you can't buy anything without a seal on top of it you know uh, whether it's the whether it's the the seal that's right on the 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 rim or maybe it's some kind of mechanism when you unscrew it I mean you guys know uh, you know all about this when my grandmother was still alive uh, she would call me over and say Jimmy you need to come over and open up uh, open up my new bottle of uh, my new bottle of milk all right how about financial risks we know about financial risks because these are risks associated with a bond issue or a bank loan so default uh, bankruptcy. I'm going to go ahead and use a term that doesn't appear in this reading called financial distress costs. These are all the costs associated with explicit bankruptcy, but also the nearing of bankruptcy. Uh, poor corporate governance. Of course, what this can do is lead to a threat of being able to make interest and principal payments. And so what are we doing here? Good corporate governance. What it's going to do is improve our transparency. And I love, I love that word integrity. Hopefully you guys have watched uh, my videos on uh, the standards. And I love to emphasize that word integrity. There we go. Independent audit. That makes point. That makes perfect sense. So look at the main point at the bottom. Good corporate governance attracts investors, improves valuations and stock performance and decreases the cost of equity. All right, so take a look at those. I think there are 14 questions at the end of this reading. Take a look at those and then take a look at our readings. And remember that this is, from my perspective, a super important reading because what it does is it teaches us how a business is supposed to operate. Hey, thank you for watching. Uh, good luck studying and have a great day.